Today's reading is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is God's word. Amen. Thank you, Marilyn. One of my earliest memories is being in Sunday school, singing this song, Sing Along If You Know It. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Sounds like you learned it too in Sunday school. That is essentially a simplified version of the doctrine we're looking at today, which is number one on this list. We're looking at the Bible, the scriptures. We're in our second week of this sermon series called Doctrines for Life, in which we're probing um, Christian theology to understand what we believe and why. Um, Let me read this to you in case you don't have it in front of you. It says, the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, consisting of 66 books, are verbally inspired by God and inerrant and infallible in the original writings and that they are of supreme and final authority. We're going to take two weeks to discuss this because it's such a big topic. The main question I want to answer today is why do we stake everything on the Bible? Why do we say that's the book for me? Why do we have a Bible at the center of our church? You know, everything we do is oriented around what's written in this book. And in fact, if we did not trust the Bible as God's word, then everything on this statement of faith would be meaningless. We should just throw it away and our faith along with it. Because it all hinges on whether the Bible is actually the word of God. Now, there there are three questions I want to untangle for us this morning. Um... If we're honest, some of us have doubts and questions and reservations about the Bible. We wonder, well, you know, some of us believe wholeheartedly what I just read, but we've never thought about it in an adult sort of uh, fully, um, you know, uh, we've never answered the question for ourselves as as adults. Uh, Some of us don't know why we believe this. Some of us believe the Bible was inspired, but we feel suspicious that something that took 3,400 years to arrive in our hands can still be trustworthy, right? How do we know this is still the Word of God? So I want to disentangle some of these questions, um, giving you three reasons why we stake everything on the Bible. The first reason is that the Bible is God's revealed Word. The second reason is that the Bible is God's inspired word. And finally, the Bible is God's preserved word for us. So, revelation, inspiration, preservation. Now, first, revelation. Imagine that you wake up in a windowless room, not knowing where you are or why you got there. You're wondering If someone is outside that door, you can sort of hear footsteps sometimes, but you don't know who that person is, if there's someone there, whether they're friend or foe. How would you figure out who that person is? You're stuck. The only way you'd be able to learn about that person is if they revealed themselves to you. Maybe they would slip a note under the door or communicate with you somehow. And that's a little bit like the predicament we're in in this world, right? We can learn something about God by looking around at creation and by seeing the work of the Creator. 
Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Paul says in Romans 1, What is made, you know, what is visible shows the eternal power and divine nature of the Creator. So you can learn something about God from that. You can learn something about God from looking within yourself and seeing the divine imprint on your reason and on your conscience. But those only take us so far. It's kind of like hearing shuffling feet outside the door. The only way we can learn the way of salvation is through God's revealed word. Let's look at the first two verses that were read just now where Paul is talking to his friend and protege Timothy. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. He's saying, Timothy, you, you learned this way of salvation through the scriptures from people and stay in that way. But you see, he learned it. He wasn't born with this knowledge, this innate knowledge of God, and neither are we. The Bible is required for us to know um, who God is, what he is like, what our true nature is as sinners yet made in his image, and what God has done to save us, and what we must do to respond to the good news. The Bible alone contains that message for us. We can't get it from the stars. We can't get it from other religious texts. We can't get it from within us. It has to come through the revelation of Scripture. So that's the first reason we depend on this book. To use another example of a song, we sing... Jesus loves me, this I know, for what the stars tell me so, my reason tells me so, for the Bible tells me so. That's why we, we believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament reveal in an utterly unique way who God is and how to be saved by him. But here's the next thing. If the Bible is God's revelation... Um, how can it be a, a human creation? Because it makes no apologies for the fact that it is totally written by human authors, right? This was not something that dropped from heaven in a completed form or someone dug up somewhere as an artifact. People, in fact, flawed people wrote this book. So how can we say it's God's revelation of himself? Well, that brings us to the doctrine of inspiration, inspiration. And the key word for us to understand about that is in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where Paul continues and says, all scripture is God-breathed. Another translation is all scripture is inspired by God. But God-breathed actually does what Paul was trying to do when he put together the word for God, theos, and breath, pneustos. And he said, this Bible is theopneustos. It's God-breathed, right? I, some people think he actually coined that word to, to communicate this idea. That God, God, out of himself, he breathed this book. Now, Another, there's a double meaning with the word breath because it's the same word for spirit. And God's spirit is what inspired the biblical authors and prophets to write what they did. Another key verse for us is uh, from the Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where he says, Prophets, through, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's this image of like, God being the wind in someone's sails, carrying them along, right? The, the authors supplied the, um, the minds and the, the hands to write and the experiences to, to perceive, and God filled it with his spirit and gave them the words that they needed to set down. So that's 
what inspiration is all about. Now, there, there are two errors we can make when thinking about the inspiration of the Bible. One is to say it was just divine dictation. God sort of possessed these people and took control of their arms and hands and wrote out what he wanted to say. And that's not at all what, what happened. The other error is to say the Bible is just a human record of what people have thought about God. So it contains errors and limitations, and, and it's not really a record of God's word to us as much as our words about God. And that's not true either. The truth is that God worked in and through these human authors, um, fully respecting their minds, their culture, their personality, their writing style, to set down his story. And the amazing thing is that he did that through so many different people over such a long period of time, starting with Moses, 1,400 years before Christ. I mean, Moses was a a shepherd turned leader. Samuel was a prophet. Uh, Amos was a fig farmer. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a tax collector. Paul was a Pharisee. And he used all these people and more to craft um, this book. It's amazing. Now, when I was in college, I went to Pasadena, California one summer to participate in like a missions training program. And when I touched down in LAX and went to get my baggage, I was approached by an unusual looking man. Um, he had uh, an orange robe and a shaved head. And I realized he was a member of the Hare Krishna uh, sect or cult. Have you heard of them? They're like a Hindu sect that is very aggressive in their uh, proselytizing. They like to hang out at the airports a lot and talk to people, and, and he was talking to me. He discovered I was a Christian, and he said, he said, okay, you say the Bible is the Word of God, right? I said, yep. Well, that can't be true because the Bible is a human document. It was written by human, human people. It has errors. It has mistakes. Um, uh, it's, it's, how can you say it's the word of God? He said, in our religion, we have the actual words of God. You see, our prophet was told exactly what to say. Uh, verbatim, God dictated to him and told him what to write. And that's what we have. We know that it's exactly the words of God. Now, when I answered him, I I kind of surprised myself with the thoughts that came to mind. I think it was the Holy Spirit. And I said, you know, I see things completely opposite. I said, the reason I love the Bible and believe it's the Word of God is because God didn't treat people like dictation devices. He, he used their, their culture and their personality and their writing style and their history and inspired them to write this this story over 1,500 years that all fits together and all tells the same story. And that's a miracle. Only God could do that. That's what it means that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And we're going to get a little deeper in this next week when we talk about the authority of Scripture. But how do we know... I want to talk about this now. How do we know that the words that God inspired way back then can still be said to be the words of God? Um, I'm going to talk about the preservation of the Bible. After all, it's been 3,400 years since the first authors began writing. Um, so through that process, a lot of people say... Um, you know, it's been translated so many times into so many different languages. How can we trust what the Bible says? Even if it was inspired back then, it's, it's like a game of telephone, right? Where, where every time it's passed on, there's a little distortion here, a little change there, and pretty soon the message is all wrong. 
And that's what I hear people saying a lot about the Bible. They dismiss it because of that. Well, I want to I put that misconception to rest. It's true that we don't have any of the original copies of Scripture. We don't have the, the Gospel of Luke that, that Luke the doctor wrote with his own hand. That's lost forever. Neither do we have the book of Genesis or uh, Habakkuk in their original form. But here's what we do have. <clears throat> Let me tell you why we can still trust that what we have is authentic. What we call the Old Testament is a collection of 39 books written in Hebrew, written between 1400 B.C. and 400 B.C. All of these books in what is our Old Testament were also considered scripture by the time Jesus, even before Jesus came. They were, you know, these books and only these books were revered and honored and preserved as scripture. Other books were written that we call now the Apocrypha. Some of them have made it into the Apocrypha, which you'll find in a Catholic Bible. But those never had the same status that these 39 books do. And because God's word was so important to Israel, to their identity as a people, they developed a very strong um, scribal tradition of copying and preserving their sacred texts. Let me give you some examples of how seriously they took that work. A scribe had to be specially trained. Uh, they were the, the most literate, the most um, knowledgeable in the Bible of any in their, in their culture. When a scribe sat down to copy a manuscript, first they went through a, a special ritual of dedicating their parchment to God. It had to be a certain kind of animal skin prepared a certain way. They dedicated it to God. Okay, and then um, as the scribe copied, he was he was expected, required to space each letter and each word at certain intervals so that there'd be no confusion later on about where the breaks were. Even if the scribe knew a passage by heart, and many of them did, they were required to copy from the authentic copy and say each word aloud as he wrote it. And after it had been finished, after each page had been checked, and rechecked and cross-checked, if so much as one slip of the pen, one misplaced accent mark or vowel was there, the whole page was destroyed and he started again. That's how painstakingly they worked to preserve the words of the Bible. And you know, history also shows us uh, how reliable this process was. In 1947, uh, two young Bedouin goat herders were walking along the rocky coast near the Dead Sea when one of them fell into a small cave. He noticed in that cave a clay vessel that had some type of a scroll in it, some type of an old document, and he took it out and brought it home and um, looked at it. He couldn't make sense of it. It was written in ancient Hebrew. Um, it sat hanging on his tent peg for a while before someone else picked it up. Eventually, it made its way into the hands of someone who realized this is like an ancient Hebrew text of Scripture. And so a team of archaeologists came back to this cave and found dozens of other caves in the same area with thousands of scrolls, manuscripts of the Old Testament, including a full and complete manuscript of the book of Isaiah and fragments of almost every other Old Testament book. And the amazing thing is that it matched almost exactly with what we have today. It showed that we do indeed have an accurate translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Dead Sea Scrolls is what they became known as. Now, what about the New Testament? <clears throat> well, similarly, God has preserved the book, books we have for us today. The 27 books that we call the New Testament were written in Greek, the language of the day, 
And the reason they were written is because as the church grew through the Roman world, it needed instruction. It needed um, uh, testimonies about Jesus, who he was, what he taught, how he died and was raised again. It needed letters of instruction from Paul and others to uh, interpret and explain the gospel. And as these letters were written, they were circulated through the Roman world to different churches and read. And very quickly, churches knew which ones were authentic and which ones were not. The authentic ones came from an apostle like Matthew or John or were based on the eyewitness testimony of an apostle like Mark or Luke or were from someone like Paul who himself knew Jesus personally through that vision and had the apostolic task given to him. All of the letters that we have in our New Testament were written within a lifetime, within that lifetime of the first apostles. And by the next generation or two, there was almost unanimous consensus that these 27 books were true scripture. That process was formalized in the year 363 at a council of, um, uh, I forget the name, but that was simply recognizing what people already accepted as these were the true um, apostolic writings about Christ. Now, we don't have time to get into all the details, but suffice it to say, a similar um, painstaking process of, of uh, transmission was true for the New Testament. And we are able to now go back and, and look at all the different ancient manuscripts we have. We have thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament to compare them with each other and to see um, with high degree of certainty what the original text would have said. There's also been an explosion of Bible translation. For a long time, you had to read Greek or Hebrew or it was translated into Latin. But, but there's a movement of the Spirit that that's, no, the Bible should be in the common languages of the people. The first big translation was the, the King James Version in 1511. And now the Bible is translated into thousands of languages. Not, not a translation of a translation of a translation, but, but for example, the NIV and other modern translations um, are translated from the best available Hebrew and Greek manuscripts that, are, that we have directly into English. So the bottom line, friends, is that you can be confident that the Bible you hold in your hands has been preserved for you through history so that you can know God. I hope that this sermon has answered some questions you might have about the nature of the Bible, about what it is and why we stake everything on it. <clears throat> we do so because it's the only word God has revealed. It's the word God has miraculously inspired. And it's been preserved for us today. But I have to say, as I close here, sometimes we conservative Christians make a mistake of, of thinking that the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, let's say, um, is more important than actually knowing what the Bible says. The point of this doctrine is to, to lead us into a confident reading of Scripture and applying Scripture to our lives. The doctrine itself is not the focus. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, the conversation recorded in John chapter 5, they were the religious conservatives of the day. They had a high view of Scripture. They had great theology, or so they thought. And Jesus confronted them and said, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Let's not make that same mistake. Right? The purpose of the Bible is to lead us to Jesus, to help, lead us into a relationship with him and to nourish us by his word. 
That is the purpose of the Bible. And in fact, the true and complete word of God is not a document, but Jesus Christ. He is the word who became flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. Hebrews chapter 1 says, God has spoken to us by his son. He is the final authoritative word. And the Bible matters because it leads us to that word. This is the word that leads us to Jesus. Jesus has opened the door into our world and come in and revealed himself fully. So, friends, will you come to Scripture and keep coming to Scripture to meet Jesus and to grow in your relationship with him, to hear his voice? That is why God has given us his word. If you've ever been to a hotel and opened up the little bedside table drawer, you've seen probably a Bible placed there by Gideon's International. And I want to read a section from the introduction they've put in that Bible, which we would do well to heed. This is what it says. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, too, heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its, its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in life, will be opened at the last judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Amen.